respected uh, fellow panelists, and it's really an honor and privilege that we have two speakers of the Gujarat and Uttarakhand Assembly here. We have Kanimuri, the fighter from the Lok Sabha. We were for a term in the Rajya Sabha together. We have other um, respected members here. And my very, very dear sisters and brothers, it's really wonderful to be here in this legislators, lawmakers conference. And I would especially like to thank the Kerala Legislative Assembly and Sri M. B. Rajesh for this wonderful initiative that you have taken. And uh, I do hope that other states also, seeing this initiative that you have taken, and including the central government and parliament, will also take an initiative to give a platform to women, to give a platform to women lawmakers, and also at different levels of governance, all those strong and inspiring women at the panchayat and local body level, we would like to also hear their voices on this occasion of 75 years of India's independence. When we talk about the Constitution and women's rights, it's a very vast subject. And my speakers, the speakers before me, have made some very important points. So I'm not going to repeat them or the articles in the Constitution. But yes, I think we do begin with paying tribute to the 15 women in the Constituent Assembly who have been, their names have been read out by Madam Kanduri. That was a very good gesture that you made. I also have their names here, and I'm not going to repeat them, but thank you for that. They were only 5% of that Constituent Assembly, but March percent. And Many of the committees which were formed of the constituent assemblies did not have a single woman. In fact, the drafting committee of which Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar was the chair, the most important committee, did not have a woman. But yet in the discussions, they made their voices heard. But if you look through and you read through the debates and discussions of the Constituent Assembly, while there was space for women, and while we note that there were many progressive men in that Constituent Assembly who spoke out for women's issues and who spoke against the discrimination against women, and I think this reflects a reality that we have in India that unlike many of the Western democracies, here in India, where women have taken the lead against patriarchal practices and notions, we have had through the ages inspiring social reformers, lawmakers, who have done pioneering work in the field of women's rights. So in India, unlike many other democracies, the fight against patriarchy has also been linked to socio-economic issues. It's a wider framework. It's not just men versus women or women versus men. And I think it is important to note that the Constituent Assembly reflected that. And that assembly also reflected another reality. How is it that 5% women and a certain section of our men in the Constituent Assembly could carve for us a document, the Constitution, which in substantive measure we can be proud of today as far as equality is concerned? How is it? According to my reading of history, and we can all have different views on this, it's primarily because of the values of the freedom movement itself. 
It was the issues of the freedom movement, which was always a pressure on the Constituent Assembly. And don't forget, the Constituent Assembly comprised of members who were property classes. The poor were not there in the Assembly. They weren't allowed the right to vote at that time under the Government of India 1935 Act. So they were property educated people. But if our constitution reflects this secular, democratic, republican character, I think primarily it is because of the people of India, the aspirations of the men and specifically women in the freedom struggle, which we see reflected in the constitution. And therefore, I would like to pay my tribute to all those unsung heroines. We know many of the names, the workers, the peasants, the women among workers and peasants who fought for India's freedom without any thought of their own lives, their own children, their own families, their own futures. They fought for India. And they fought for India with a unity which made sure that India was freed from colonial regime. So I think this is the context in which we look at the Constitution. We cannot look at the Constitution without the context of the people of India. And when we look at women's rights as part of this Constitution, and my friends and uh, uh, respected and very well-read fellow panelists will no doubt read out all the articles, etc., etc. But I would like to just take three aspects in which I believe women's rights are embedded. The first is the basic character of the Constitution, which starts with the preamble, we the people of India. And what does it mean? Of course, it means democracy, we the people. But I think more than that, it means that our constitution is not linked to any religious text or injunction. Madam Speaker from Uttarakhand had given very interesting quotations from different texts. I'm sure in all religious texts, you will find both pro-woman and extremely and grossly anti-women statements or cultures or injunctions. But our constitution is not colored by any specific religion. So our power, yes, our constitution gives a personal right for belief. And every religion has its place in our constitution. It is seen as a personal right. You could be a believer or non-believer, but in India, you're an equal citizen. There is no grading of citizenship based on religion in which there are in many parts of the world today. Theocratic societies who use religion as their framework to decide social relations and social rights. And we have seen how such theocracy, uh, theocracies bulldoze in many ways women's rights. So I think one of the most important frameworks of the Indian Constitution is precisely this, that while each citizen has the right to believe or not believe in the religion of her choice, the Constitution itself does not have a color of any religion. So we are not at all guided by texts. And I believe this basic character of the Constitution, I'm not talking about the word secular, which was added in 1976. I'm talking about what the Supreme Court has said the basic structure of the Constitution of India includes secularism. 
And therefore today, when we talk about women's rights, it is important for us not to take it for granted. Please do not take it for granted. Because if there are right-wing consolidations in any particular direction, in the name of any religion, please remember, it is women and women's rights which are going to suffer. And therefore, any assault on the basic structure of the Constitution and women's rights flowing from it is something that all of us as women lawmakers, wherever we are in whichever party, as women in defense of women's rights, my dear friends, it is our duty to stand up and say, no, this is not going to happen. It is not going to happen to India. We are not going to mimic theocratic societies. We are a free, secular society, and we aim to remain so. So that is the first point where I believe that women's rights are embedded. The second, of course, is the Republican democratic character of the Constitution. And both our uh, earlier speakers were, have mentioned how important democracy is and given lovely examples also. I look at it, um, if you look at it from the women's point of view, I sometimes wonder why at that time there was no very specific mention of the issue of violence against women and the issue of a constitutional right to live in a safe environment. Perhaps in those days, after the freedom struggle. Although, of course, there were so many struggles of women against violence in different ways. It's not specifically reflected in the Constitution of India, but now we see through various court interpretations that Article 21, which is the right to life and liberty, is a very, very critical aspect of the fundamental rights of the Constitution because it defends the right to life and liberty and dignity. And I think that is what the women of India had fought for. So to that extent, even though there's no specific mention, the issue of democracy and the issue of the right to vote the issue of adult franchise, all these issues in the fundamental rights chapter, I think, are very critical. And therefore today, when civil liberties are under attack in any way, from wherever, from whichever government, when democracy is under attack, when violence becomes a weapon, then again, we have to see how women are affected. Because as we all know, my dear sisters, women's bodies are seen as sites to play out all kinds of politics. The politics of communalism, the politics of casteism. You want to teach somebody a lesson. Who is the symbol which is first attacked? It is women. And therefore, attacks on democracies and attacks on civil liberties in whichever form they come, that is something, I believe, which deeply affects us as women. And this aspect of the Constitution, the aspect of democracy and democratic rights, is critical for women and their movements for change. And the third aspect of the Constitution is the entire approach against the toxic caste system. Caste which is an abomination in any civilized country. And we, and 5,000 years and more of our civilization, and yet today you cannot ignore the reality that caste plays the most horrendous role in the pursuit of power at the village level, at the local level, and it is Dalit women 
who are the worst affected. Dalit women at the bottom of a social hierarchy which has been prohibited by the Constitution of India. But we know the many, many ways that it still exists. In about 20 years ago in Tamil Nadu, the cradle of social reform, an organization of Dalits did a survey as to what are the kind, of, the ways that untouchability is practiced. And they identified 103 different ways that untouchability and discrimination is practiced. And this is in the cradle of a social reform movement. Kani Muri will know about it because she too has fought so many cases against the Dalit atrocities. And for women, of, although Dalit women obviously are the most affected, but I believe that the constitutional ban, prohibition on caste and casteist practice is essential for women of all castes because it imprisons us. It imprisons women. And overrides the autonomy of women to make their own choices. So if you look at the Constitution and women's rights, along with the various articles, and if you look at it in these three aspects, you can see how important it is to preserve these rights in the Constitution. However, I believe strongly that there was a terrible compromise made in the Constituent Assembly in which a big section of rights, quoted again by uh, Madam Speaker of Uttarakhand, are put in the directive principles of the Constitution, which are not enforceable in a court of law. And those very, very important provisions are against inequality. They talk about the right to livelihood as a fundamental right. That means a right to work is a fundamental right. These are rights which are germane and intrinsic to the development of any society, and especially women in that society. But in our constitution, the right to work is not a fundamental right. The right to equal wage, there's a law for it. But those provisions of health Right to health is a fundamental right. Those are all kept in the directive principles of the Constitution. And we all know what is happening to the directive principles of the Constitution. So I think in these 75 years, the struggle to make many of the provisions of the directive principles into enforceable rights as constitutional rights, I think that is an agenda that all of us and all of you as lawmakers should keep in your minds for any opportunity you get on the floor of parliament, on the floor of assemblies to raise these issues. One more aspect. Unanimously, all the 15 members of the constituent assembly said, hame reservation nahi They said, we don't want reservation. It's a special privilege we don't want. Now, there are many reasons for that. I'm not going into it now. But I believe, perhaps they believed that, you know, India is going to be just and fair to them and India's politics is going to be just and fair to them. But today, we all know that even the miserable global average of 25%, we are well below that. Madam said 9%, absolutely correct. In fact, it's 8.8%. And in parliament, we're still just 14%. Of course, there are political parties who have taken the step of giving many more tickets to women. That's a very positive thing. And all of us who are in politics fight for that. However, it's very clear that unless we have the law for 33% reservation, reservation of seats, we are going to take another 75 years to get to even 33%.
So I entirely support the suggestion made by uh, the first speaker, the Honorable Speaker of Gujarat, that we should have a resolution from this conference, from all the lawmakers across political parties saying, yes, we want 33% in the 75th year of India's independence. And finally, I, as, as lawmakers, because each of you has a journey, I know. We belong to different parties, we fight each other politically. That's fine. We have differences, that's also fine. We don't have to say we don't have differences. We do have political differences, fine. But are there any areas in which, just like 33%, we can all work together with a common aim? I believe we should look for that. Now, right here in this conference, you have the Congress, you have the BJP, you have the TMC, you have the RJD, you have the DMK, you have the AAP party, you have many of the Kerala parties here, the Money Congress and others, and you have the CPI, you have the CPM. We all belong to different parties. But isn't it a fact that sexism in politics sexist comments. They don't want to fight politically, but they will point to you and say, Are ye aurat ka to ye ye ye. What happened yesterday? I don't know if Supriya is here. She was a speaker, but she's not here. She raised a question, a political question. Now, I may totally disagree with that question, but if she is told by a respected leader of a political party in that state that she doesn't know politics, let her go home and cook. What is it? I mean, what is it? First of all, if that gentleman himself could cook, he wouldn't have insulted cooks of India in that way. But forget that. Forget that. Why insult? in an entirely sexist, male supremacist way. And I know that there are women politicians who are heading parties who have had to face many such insults. Now, if as women, whichever party we're in, we fight politically, but let us at least ensure in parliament and assemblies a code of conduct which has a ban and prohibition of sexist comments against women in public life. Let us come together. Whichever party, if my party leader speaks about a woman leader in a way which is degrading, he may be thinking that he is degrading a particular woman leader, but in fact, all of us get degraded. Democracy gets degraded. Public discourse gets completely smashed. And where's the space? So the point is, along with women's reservations, there are many other issues like this on which there may be common experiences and common ground, and certainly one of them is the kind of sexism which is becoming rampant in Indian politics. And I think it's time that we women, lawmakers in women's struggles, draw the line. This is the Lakshman Rekha, and if you cross it, you are going to be in trouble. I think that is something also we can consider from this conference, if you all think that it is worth following. And if you think not, well, at least in your own assemblies, in your own parties and in parliament, maybe I'm sure Kanimuri agrees with me and she can represent all of us and make such a resolution in the Lok Sabha. So I thank you very, very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. And once again, MB Rajeshji, thank you very much. More strength to you in Kalab Zindabad.
Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that firebrand speech.